I work with Venrock. It's one of the Silicon Valley venture capital firms, and I'm kind of the science guy there, so I'm very interested in drones. Ergo, here I am. Uh, we've got a very impressive group of people. I am the scent of a bunch of really hard questions, which they've been studying for days. So now is, I haven't talked to them since, so we're going to see how, what grade they get on the test. You'll be able to ask them questions too. Um, I think the first thing I'll do, I, I, I've gone back and forth on this. I think I'm, rather than have me butcher their backgrounds, I'm going to have them give like a one or two sentence, their name, um, who they're affiliated with, and kind of what their, what their focus is. So let me just go right down the row here. So Ian? I'm Ian Yule. I, um, I'm a professor of precision agriculture at Massey University in Palmerston North in New Zealand, and I run a, a research center on precision agriculture. We have an ac academic programs, research students, and we run a reasonably large contract research uh, portfolio. And Ian's going to be our content expert here to keep all these uh, uh, company tech guys honest about how, how the products match the market. So. It's up to you to keep them honest. Okay. You right. go by Matt or Matthew? Uh, Matt. Matt. Okay. Unless I'm in trouble. Okay. That, yeah. I know that was Steve yep. or Steven. Yep. Yeah, I got exactly. that. Uh, I'm Matt Coleman, uh, Senior Director and Certified Photogrammetrist for Precision Hawk. Um, we're an end-to-end -end solution UAV company from everything from manufacturing the drones, integrating the sensors, to doing the data processing, the safety, and also the analytics and product deliverables. Great. Okay. Hey, Mike? Um, Michael? Work? Yeah. Hey, I'm Mike. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Drone Deploy. We make drone software that's used across almost every industry from crime scene investigation to archaeology to agriculture. Agriculture happens to be our largest market. And since we're talking about New Zealand, we actually have a whole bunch of people using our products, well, across the board in 100 countries, including New Zealand, who we actually have a customer coming across all the way from New Zealand next week. Um, we do very much a lot of the same things as Precision Hawk, but we just focus on the software, and that makes us accessible to any drone, particularly to the lower end, to DJIs, where um, we basically we make them ex tools that are useful for business. Was that a mistake putting you two together, or can you? Yeah, we're, we're friendly. <laughs> okay, all right, good. okay, all right, Linda. Hi, my uh, my name is Linda Bulk. I'm one of the founding directors of a company called Aeronavics Limited. Uh, about five, six years ago, we started and uh, manufacturing drones, uh, which back then was very special. Uh, it's not so special anymore. There's so many drone manufacturers. Uh, we've just come back from the NAB in Las Vegas, and there's literally hundreds of them. Uh, but I think that our products are still very special. We, we really focus on the uh, industrial, commercial end of, of drone solutions. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, that's what we do. Great. Thank you. And my, my friend Gareth from Qualcomm. Hey, I'm Gareth Keane. I'm an investor with the team at Qualcomm Ventures. We're Qualcomm's corporate venture arm. We deploy about $200 million a year into startups that touch Qualcomm's ecosystem in some way. And one area we're super excited about is robotics and autonomy and drones as, as part of that. We're one of the more active investors in the drone ecosystem and have funded companies on the tech stack all the way from components and technologies at the, the bottom of the stack. Uh, companies like Swift Navigation here in San Francisco who are doing precision GPS through platforms like 3D Robotics in Berkeley, and then enterprise solutions like Skycatch in San Francisco, and Flirty, who are sort of also in San Francisco, but not really. Um, yeah, so active investors, know a lot of companies in the space, and very excited about the applications in agriculture. Well, great. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut right to the chase. Those of you that know me, it's kind of my MO. Just cut right to the chase. We all recognize that agriculture and farmers and the you know, agriculture ecosystem can benefit from more data, right? You're looking for better productivity. We all know that, done. We also all hear about drones. It's certainly not yesterday's news. It's been, um, it's an exciting thing, you know, from the military to commercial and to consumer. Uh, I think we all understand what the possibilities are. The real question is, here we are today in an ag tech conference with in the question, how do drones and, and agriculture go together? Is it make sense? Does it work? What are the benefits? What are the, uh, what are the disadvantages? What are the alternatives? So let me just cut right to it here and just add the first question. Um, so why do you think drones in the last couple of years have become interesting to the agriculture market, given that aerial photogrammetry and satellite imaging has been around for 20 or 30 years? Wh why now with drones? Uh, go ahead, Ian. Okay. Um, 
maybe if I can... From, from the user perspective. From, from the user's perspective, I think part of it is accessibility, that people see that this is an immediately accessible <coughs> kind of technology that they can use. Um, remember, we've had sensors for 20 years. We've had sensors that we can put on our spray equipment, on our, our, on our machinery, yet they've achieved very low levels of use. And I think that's one of the things that troubles some of us that have been around for longer than we'd like to remember, is that, um, you know, so what's new? And I think one concern is, will the bubble burst? Is it all going to be just over in a, a few years? But I think what we're seeing now is that the, the mature, and I think if, <clears throat> if the products hadn't matured, then it would have been. But I think what we're seeing now is, a, is the, the market's actually developing. We've got new craft that can do better things. There's a higher level of automation. There's a higher level of control. The sensors that we're using are, are improving. Okay. So the information, it's not so much about the data, it's about the information for the, for the uh, farmer. And I think the, the value of the information is getting better. Okay. And it's getting perhaps more reliable. And certainly in a spatial sense. Okay. Well, let's, good. Let, yep. let's let these guys uh, 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 tell us why we should buy their products. Yeah, uh, to expand a little bit on what Ian mentioned is definitely the scalability now, due to the automation the, and the things that he mentioned in particular, is you know before going out and flying one field took you know manual flight. You were very very restricted with regulations. You know the ability to uh, now with the automation of the flight management systems, the drones themselves, the processing. Now we can fly multiple fields, larger fields. Uh, better endurance with the aircraft themselves and the ability to fly higher with the FAA loosening up the regulations a little bit. Um, in addition, there's also the ability with the algorithms now, where before it was maybe an orthomosaic, uh, ND, D, or NDVI map. Now what we can do with algorithms is actually do crop counting, crop height analysis, uh, water pooling analysis. It just keeps, I mean, week by week, you know, keeps growing and growing. Great. Um, Mike, yeah. You encourage some friendly debates. I'm going to side with, uh, with you, sorry, it was Ian? Ian. Ian, the, the biggest thing I think now is the biggest reason people are adopting drones, they're really accessible. Um, before, when you wanted to buy a drone, like six years ago, it took a real drone expert to get a drone up in the air, taking images, processing their data. Nine times out of 10, there'll be some problem, you'd have to do it again. Now you can actually go out to the field, you can have a little backpack, you can use a product that costs $1,000, you can press two taps on your, on your phone. Actually, for our product, our key, um, like, um, selling point is actually its simplicity. We, we a had a, a blog post this, uh, this year for April 1st. We had a version of our app that our dog could use. He literally pressed a button with his paw, a drone took off, took photos, and we just said you need to upload data to the drone deploy service, which starts from free. You can get that data, you can get that bird's eye view in a couple of hours. That was never before possible. It's in fact never been be possible before for a farmer to say, hey, I want to get a bird's eye view of my field today. Okay. If they want to do that, they had to, there was, Try and, they had to try and find a crop duster, sit in it, and take a photo of their field. Now they can go out there with a product that costs $1,000 and do it without needing any training or um, yeah, any significant investment of either time or money. So, Linda, are they right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's absolutely true. But I think that the main reason why that drone technology is so incredibly developed, like, and it's been an amazing sort of, you know, uh, it's an amazing event, is, is because the need is there more so than ever before. I mean, there's a growing population. There's a food shortage. We all know the reasons why we need to produce more uh, uh, food uh, with less resources. And I think that, therefore, there's more looking for tools to achieve that uh, than ever before. And that's probably a reason why we've seen this, um, this rapid development. I'm going to ask Gareth a different question. Well, actually, but, can I just give one no, different, you different get perspective? No, but you get to answer both. OK. OK, so I'm going to give you another question. You get to weave them. I, I told his wife, who was here, I was going to give him the hard questions. And see what, um, so there's alternatives out there. We've got a whole. Uh, um, sort of nascent industry, probably kind of nascent, um, of uh, nanosatellites. You know, at 100 miles up, they're going to put these, uh, th you know, they're kind of in three markets. They're in, they're in the imaging market, they're in the communications market, and there's a few weather satellite companies. But there's a bunch of them that have focused on imaging. And they're not, you know, at 20,000 miles up like some of the other satellites. And so maybe you could give some perspective. In the agriculture market, wh why aren't the satellite guys going to win? 
So I think it's a great question, and I'm personally an investor both in drone companies and in nanosat companies, so I see both sides of the table. But uh, I think the first part of your question, I think one of the really interesting drivers for adoption of this technology has been the consumer electronics sort of cycle, development cycle. The fact that you don't have to go to a Boeing and in situ, or you don't have to go to a you know, a general dynamics and rent a predator for a couple of hours to go cruise your field. You can take a cell phone development cycle and build a very capable autonomous robot using that platform of processing, communication, and sensor integration. And I think you see the same thing in the nanostat revolution, right? It's, it's enabling this ability to put very low cost devices into L low earth orbit as well. In terms of which is going to win, I think the ultimate solutions will be sort of a, a heterogeneous technology pyramid. You'll be able to get very fast refresh on demand you know, super fidelity small footprint sensor readings from a drone or even from a ground-based autonomous robot, and you'll get more macro field level pictures from, from space. So I think it will be sort of data platforms that take inputs from all of these sort of data feeds. As we come back down the row, because I think people want to, the other guys want to comment on that second question, what, um, are there different technologies that drones can bring to bear? You know, kind of the question already, multi-spectral imaging or other kinds of sensors that the satellites can do? Or do you get better performance at lower altitudes? And how do you trade that off against, you know, less coverage but better resolution versus more coverage and not in terms of dollars per acre? So um, is that, are the technology differences, uh, is it broader than just altitude? So I think, it's so easy to take a new sensor that's been developed and put it onto an airframe and fly it over a field. You can do that in an hour. Whereas getting something into LEO, that's like an 18 month process, even with nanosat development sort of cycles, right? Once they're up. But once they're up, no, I'm, then talking, I'm assuming we're, we're gonna make apples to apples comparison, that the satellite fleets that aren't quite up there are gonna be up. So projecting three years from now, when we have drones, nanosats, and the full geosats, that's kind of the context. Yeah, I think there will always be a need for different levels of sort of sensor capability at different levels of height, you know, whether it's atmospheric or, or ex-atmospheric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, well, there's certainly a difference that you, uh, you can see between data being captured by drones and by other means, like even, you know, you know, a little bit closer rather than out of space and drone, uh, full-size aircraft and drones. Right. We've had uh, a customer in the forestry industry that is uh, carrying a LIDAR and, this, and, and the data that they were capturing was like 10 times as much as they would get out of an aircraft even. However, then there's a challenge of what are we going to do with these huge volumes of data and how are you going to turn that into relevant information? Uh, but there are certainly um, uh, ways that uh, drones allow for data capturing in a far higher level of detail than some other means. Okay. We'll work our way down. Yeah. I was just going to say, horses for courses. That's really what you need to do. Like, you, it's interesting, actually, you think about it at a, a satellite at 4, 000, uh, it's 400 kilometers away, something from Planet Labs, versus a drone at 400 feet. That's a 3,000 times difference in altitude. It's actually impossible for the optics to, to make that difference in, in a small nanosat. So what you're seeing is you're going to have massive coverage from companies like Planet Labs, but actually at relatively poor resolution that you can, you can kind of look at a field, but even now it's like you can't get that much information. Three to five meters per pixel, that's all they can do. That's all they can do. Uh, where, and you, so you can get an amazing macro view you can see across a whole country. But a drone enables you to actually take action on not what's happening in the country, but what's happening in your field right now. You can start to see the pests that are coming infiltrating, or we have problems in variants from, I don't know, nitrogen deficiency or flooding. And you can actually take immediate, uh, you can take immediate action on that. So different types of, uh, you're going to be doing different types of things. And for our company, we definitely see the event-driven work that you can do with a drone right now is to get the data today, make a r response today, is actually going to create a lot, of value, a lot more value than, say, something from a nanosat, which is more about market determination and things like that. So, um, you know, at Precision Hawk, we actually think of, you know, whether it's a manned aircraft, a drone, or a satellite, they're all tools in a toolbox. I mean, sometimes you don't need a sledgehammer, you know, to hang a picture frame. So we keep our software agnostic. We can bring all the software, all the different data in from different data types because all the client cares about really are the answers. You know, and I came from spending 10 years on the manned aerial craft side, about 3,000 hours in the airplane flying aerial LIDARs and cameras. You know, and how I got into this market was the ability with a drone to go out and one day fly LIDAR, you know, hyperspectral, multispectral, thermal for, you know, a tenth of the cost would it be to mobilize a helicopter and an airplane and switching out sensors on the ground. So 
I think the ability to switch out multiple sensors is one of the key things right now with the drones that can't really be done affordably at all with manned aircraft and can't be done at all with uh, satellite imagery. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, we see ourselves more in the sensing game rather than the drone game. I mean, with different platforms that we use, and I think Matt's absolutely right. It's a toolbox approach that we will use different things for different uh, purposes. But the the original name for New Zealand was Aotearoa, which means land of the long white cloud. So cloud, there's no great merit in taking lots of satellite images of clouds, especially the top side. Uh, same goes for aircraft. There's a limited number of days that we can run aircraft. There's a limited number of days that we can run um, drones as well, because or UAVs, because it rains. We have a lot of you know a lot of precipitation. That's why we can grow lots of grass. So there are limitations with every technology that you that you meet. And I guess one of the things that we're interested in is how can we overcome some of those weather difficulties? How can we overcome some of those? difficulties in terms of lighting to actually make these different technologies robust. So maybe in an orchard, for example, where you've got uh, a lot of ground cover, the answer is to put the sensor on a robot and you have different views. So it's horses. it really is horses for courses and the interoperability between data is really important. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that these platforms will evolve from sensors and capturing data to manipulating the environment, right? So as you start applying stuff from a platform having the ability to sort of, you know, recharge a sprayer or, you know, deploy seeds, whatever it might be. That's something that a drone will do very effectively. So um, uh, two more questions about technology, and then we'll kind of switch over to market. So I'm um, not sure, um, not being an ag person per se, but when one thinks about truth, in other words, there's a certain amount of fertilizer that you need to put on, or the plant needs a certain amount of water at a certain time, or the NVDI index has to be... And there's instruments that you can make, make on the ground, you know, use on the ground that are going to give you sort of the best sense. But the whole idea is you can't walk the whole field. The whole point is the productivity of these bigger views and more automated views. So my question is, where is the market today with the imaging and the sensor packages in terms of its tie, its its, uh, its connection to truth on the ground? In other words, is is the data we're getting is it? as good as it can be, or are there algorithms that have to match it based on you know, temperature, pressure, humidity, all, all of these other things? I don't know. S somebody jump in. Well, I'll, um, you know, a real life example that we've done over the past two years is we've been working on a crop counting algorithm mainly for corn and soybean. And what's fascinating is the fact that the tractors that are actually planting the crops, you know, they're actually counting the seeds and you actually have a latitude and longitude for each seed that is planted. So when we actually fly it with our drone or with a manned aircraft and run the crop count algorithm, we can go back and compare it to the truth that came out of the tractor. Yeah, I guess it's trying to compare it to what we consider the truth. And that, again, NDVI, well, what does it mean? It's, it's just a measure of how much chlorophyll there is there. So what does that matter? Well, it may matter between different seasons and, you know, that we're, we've had so many degree days and we're at this NDVI rather than where we were last year with this particular variety. So there's a lot of other information that needs to be included in the equation. But I think we need to, it's part of the equation, it's not the full equation, and, and we've really got to, I think, make that point to, to people. But also it's, again, horses for courses. What is it you want to do? I mean, we do some other stuff where we're looking at the, the nutrient concentration within plants, and that's perhaps a more sophisticated technology, but it has a different use. So it's, you know, again, what is the end use that you want to make of the information is really quite key to what information do you really need to give you the answer that you want to work towards. Yeah, we've seen a bunch of really interesting work. I think there's a lot of headroom for people to develop technologies in the space around, you know, moving from multispectral to true hyperspectral and how tightly you sort of slice that spectrum up. You can actually get some really interesting signatures that give you sort of disease modalities and indicate troubled plants. And then we've also seen some really interesting things going on in, in other areas where people are sort of synthesizing information from multiple different feeds and sort of, you know, plugging it into sort of a, a farm ERP on the back end. Yeah, and, and just... Just in addition to that, um, what you see with any technology development, it starts somewhere and then it progresses into something else. And, and I think what we've been seeing here is 
you know, at first uh, we're, we're creating the sensor and then we start or, or gathering the information with the sensors and then we start calibrating the sensors really based on information that has been gathered. And there's a lot of, uh, well, more data that has been gathered and there's been a lot of data gathering going in the last couple of years more and more and that's now starting to being turned into very specific information. I think that there's a lot of data that can already be interpreted, which is already a progression to f from where we came, but we're starting to get to data uh, that can start to be measured and then it becomes true information. Okay. Well, let, all right. So this isn't really a technical question, but sort of lies between the technology and the market, and that's the regulatory issues. So let me just ask it this way. So for a, uh, for a lay person like me in the, in the agriculture business, um, I'm thinking that the farms are sort of out where there aren't any people and there aren't anything else. So, I mean, I'll, I'll ask the question in this sense, is how big an issue are regula um, FAA and aircraft-related sort of safety regulations, how significant are they today in the industry, in this industry, and, and do they have to change? So, Mike, I'll let you go first. Um, yeah, I'm, I might start with a bit of a contrary view. Um, Regulations are, of course, really important, and it's really important that we can operate this new technology in a safe way that is non-destructive to value in other, other sectors. Um, we've heard so many stories about, about <coughs> drones entering into the airspace around airports, things like that. It's obviously a terrible thing. No, none of us, nobody in the drone industry wants to, to see, um, see any damage come to any aircraft because <laughs> we all fly ourselves. But it's interesting to see, like, the, there's a lot of panic as well in the space. We heard about a few days ago Apparently, I think it was a, a, a aircraft in the UK apparently hit a drone. And three days later, analysis has been done, and that drone was potentially a plastic bag. Um, so it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how this ways, plays out. At the moment, there's a lot of caution about drones and the damage they can cause. On the other hand, they're very small devices. If you, if you can have very large ones, but generally they're very small devices. They don't pose a very large risk to people. And so we're seeing an increasingly increasing move towards a risk-based approach where small drones are perceived as almost risk-free. Anything under 250 grams, for example, is seen as risk-free. Um, and what that is enabling is if we, as we move to that, and as the thought moves to that, is people are starting to just, well, people are just flying their drones. Like we're seeing, irrespective of the laws in any country, we've got drones flying in over 100 countries. People are going out there and flying and I, I'm not sure what the laws are in all the, the states, countries they're in, but they're going out there and doing stuff. It's unclear what's allowed and what's not allowed, what they can do is commercially and not commercially, and they're just going out and creating value because they see it as more value than risk. But So we've got this kind of this dynamic of tension where a lot of the market is just going out and doing, where some of the market's kind of holding back. Well, um, I, let me ask Gareth, as, as an investor, I mean, uh, What's your biggest fear? I mean, if there's a couple of airline crashes and thousands, several hundreds of people die in the United States, let me just speak for the U.S., um, is that going to put the kibosh on the growth in this industry? So I think, you know, investors typically like to mitigate and minimize risk as much as possible, right? You have this sort of risk versus reward scenario. So there's no denying there are issues. I do feel, though, you know, the FAA has been very heavy-handed in the U.S. in terms of how it's approaching regulating airspace. Um, the world's a very big place, luckily, and I know Precision Hawk's been very successful in Canada, for example. There are other jurisdictions that are much more open to deploying drone and UAV technologies in ag. I think, you know, nine of the most scary words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. The FAA is just not very helpful sometimes. So, yeah, I, I see that as a risk factor for the U.S. And in fact, just at a more macro level, I see it as a risk factor for the U.S. losing what has been a very significant technology lead, right, historically in aerospace. So that's, that's a concern for me. Yeah, I think the, the situation might be slightly different in New Zealand in that we do have access to our civil aviation authority and they, we can ring them up and talk to them and we can meet with them and, and many of us do on a sort of fairly regular basis. But we still have re regulation in terms of we, we don't, we're not required to be a qualified pilot to operate a UAV, so that's a, a significant advantage. We still need to have an observer in the field as well as the person piloting the aircraft for many applications, that's a cost. The, so I think where we've got to is we've been allowed to fly, we're getting a lot of experience and we're developing the industry. What I would like to see as an operator, one of the things I could really reduce my cost with is if I can fly out of line of sight. And I know that from even with a, 
with our relatively friendly civil aviation authority that getting beyond line of sight is going to be a bit of an issue. And we've got to prove that it's safe, and I perfectly understand that. But I think that's where we've got to get to in order to, to make UAVs a much more cost-effective way to, to, to operate. Any other comments on that topic? Uh, I, I, I completely agree with uh, Ian there. And I want to say one thing positive towards the FAA is they have started the, you know, the Pathfinder program along with the NASA UTM program. And what, you know, to show kind of how they're being more proactive is just a few weeks back, you know, they raised the, the uh, certificate of authorization minimum from 200 feet to 400 feet. So now you can fly anywhere in the U.S. besides close to airports or congested areas at 400 feet instead of 200 feet. So that's a, a huge improvement. Also, what they've been doing is working over, there's actually a conference in Daytona this week with the FAA, when they're supposed to be releasing the new rules where you don't have to be a, a licensed pilot. Is, that's, what, that's what the industry is hoping is going to happen here soon, which is going to really open up the market for the folks who, you know, you know, they can't pay the seven to 10000 for a sports license to go fly their drone, but they have a small survey company or, or a small farm that could really use it. Linda, you want to add something? Well, yeah, maybe in, in, um, in addition to that, um, I think, I mean, I don't think that there's actually a risk. I think it'll all happen. There's too much momentum already, and everyone sees the benefits of the technology. Uh, it's just how it's going to be implemented. It's a bit like I often compare it to the car industry. And, you know, you've got your uh, warrant of fitnesses of your car that ensures that your car is safe and sound on the road. You've got your driver's license. And it sort of secures uh, how the technology of driving a car is being embedded in our in our sort of... Um, uh, um you know, cultures. And it'll be the same with drones, just takes a little bit of time to uh, get all of that happening. Um, what, what, what Ian was saying, <coughs> excuse me, what, what Ian was saying is absolutely true. The main uh, benefit of this technology is when it becomes fully autonomous uh, and will do just its thing out in the field. And um, it's a bit like the driverless car that is coming. I think that we're starting to get prepared for that uh, in our own sort of, you know, adaptation to uh, to be okay with that. And I think um, this is where we as a company are focusing on uh, mostly is, is a roadmap towards uh, having pods sitting out in the field with craft that just come out, do their thing, and not even provide you with all the data that they're gathering fully autonomously, but even just provide you with that information that is relevant to the question that you have. Yeah, can I just continue that thought? Like, uh, that's definitely where we're going in the next 10 years. And that's what's most exciting. You think of these robots that are flying above us, they need babysitters. There's lots of companies that actually go out there with a drone professional, with a pilot to go and they drive a drone 200 miles to go and operate it. It just seems crazy. Um, but I think as a technologist, I'm definitely one of those people that gets ahead of myself and thinks, ah, oh, if only we could fly out of line of sight, it's really going to help us. If only we could do it and have little pods. And that's definitely going to happen. But actually, what's interesting right now is that people are doing a lot of things, creating a ton of value right now, irrespective of those things. And now, we can even kind of go back. Like We talked a lot about the sensors and different multispectral and hyperspectral. But fundamentally, the zero to one moment in drones is not getting a fancy camera. It's just getting a camera for the first time getting somebody a bird's eye view. That's going to be the most value creation in the drone space. Uh, and then it's just incrementally from there. So. I, I don't want people here to feel like, hey, we need all these things before, before we can be useful. There are tens of thousands of commercial drone operation, operating pilots out there in America right now. Most of them are probably acting in a, in a le legal gray area. They don't have pilots and things like that. But you can get value out of a drone today without all of these things. And, that's, and you're going to get that zero to one moment. You're going to get that, that, in, that value that's the, the biggest jump in value that you could, will ever see in the drone space right now with just getting a cam one camera up there. All right, let me, let me switch to the market. We'll spend the last few minutes. I got a couple of, I'll ask the toughest questions last. We'll get them all warmed up here. So um, in this building, for example, if, we, if, if the landlord of this building wanted to save money, maybe the two biggest things they could do is make the heating and air conditioning system more efficient and maybe change the incandescent or fluorescent lighting to LED lights. It's another big market that, that investors and, and technologists are interested in. But the big hitters are the lighting and the HVAC. My question to you all, and Ian, you get to keep them honest here, is in the, in, in for the, you know, if you guys can qualify it, whether it's a large farm or a small farm, or a large company or a small company, in terms of the things they do to improve their bottom line, where does this imagery and sensing data lie? In other words, we already have convinced ourselves it's the coolest thing since sliced bread. 
We know that people like it, and it appears to be interesting. The, my question is how interesting? How important economically is it to the farmers in the big, in the big scheme of things, in terms of all the, the crops they pick and the times of the year they plant? What, how does this play? Who's, who's gonna go first? Well, you know, I'd say it boils down to crop yield. And the ability, not only you know, from the drone itself, but even taking a manned or satellite imagery, is a fact to be able to fly you know, with these drones over the smaller fields, manned or satellite over the larger fields, but using really the analytics and some of the processing that's been developed because of the drone industry is huge. So, I mean, if you can increase your yield by doing the NDVI or some of the crop count or crop health analysis by 5% across the spectrum, that is life-changing and truly life-changing across the world. Well, yeah, and you know, I think personally um, that there is a lot of data still. Like, like I said before, I think there is a lot of calibration happening uh, and not enough measurement, yes, for me to quantify, um, uh, you know, yield. But I think that there is already an acknowledgement of yield that's to start with. And, you know, I think um, to uh, sort of join the words of my neighbor, what is very quantifiable is that I in the sky, like we've had a, a, a farmer um, that um, uh, has quantified that he spends 200 hours less per year on a quad bike, that he's not as susceptible to have an accident on the quad bike, and that he can save uh, 40 sheep, 40 ewes, because he can spot them on their uh, uh, back uh, uh, rather than uh, finding him dead, you know, in the morning sort of thing. So those are um, quantifiable sort of benefits that, uh, that we've seen. I think that's a great question. <laughs> um, I remember when we started to go into talk to farmers, you'd ask them, hey, what's that the traditional question? What's that thing that keeps you up at night? What's your biggest constraint in your business? It was never, I'm not using a drone yet. I need to use it. It's, what's the weather going to be like this year? Am I going to get flooding? What, what's going to happen with my labor? Um, those are the biggest factors for them. But that doesn't mean a drone isn't valuable. Just as you're saying, like those incremental gains, that's incremental gains directly to their profit margin. Um, right now, there's a number of case studies on our website. Go to blog.dronedeploy.com. Um, farmers across different types of farms yielding, um, yeah, they're sa saving up to $100 an acre for a variety of reasons because they've identified which was the best species of potato to plant in their saving specific crop. Saving $100 per acre when they're making a couple hundred dollars an acre. And so you're saying it's very material. Very material. Um, it depends on the scenario. Yeah. There was this guy, he, he had flooding in his field. He had to choose the right variety for this particular field. He's going to get higher yields next year. They're identif able to identify problems in the calibrations of their planting machines, able to identify when they actually had a broken part. Um, and that's just like the beginning of the, the tens of, of reasons that you would use a drone as a farmer. So you're definitely going to, it's like, just like understanding and doing analytics on a website or something like that. It's going to empower you with insights that you, didn't know, you wouldn't have known before to actually make changes to the way you do business that all incrementally will add up to a re really large number. Great. Ian, you want to I guess, Yeah, I guess in, in view of trying to keep these guys honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's why you're here. They, we've, we've used sensors for about 20 years, and people like Craig have used sensors in their crops and still use sensors in their crops. And there's been a lot of academic studies that have shown that sometimes the benefit is extremely marginal. And in fact, sometimes they've shown that there's been no benefit at all. But I think the trouble with kind of academic studies is that they've sort of looked at one aspect of it. Now, I could take you to Craig's farm or to there's other farmers that I know, and they would see, it's to them, it's evidence. And what they're not making up their mind about, yeah, it's all about nitrogen, or it's all about this, or it's all about that. They're, they're looking to see, well, what is the problem? And I know Craig, for example, uses a lot of, uh, he does variable rate nitrogen. I know another farmer who doesn't. And what he decided his problem was, was drainage. It was clear to him by using imagery um, that it was drainage that it was his problem. So he's gone about and spent thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of dollars on drainage on a fairly large property. So each farmer will look at the evidence and then decide. And I think we've just got to actually have a bit of trust in the farmer as well, that they can make a judgment. And some will make a judgment that they've looked at this mapping once or twice, and it's really not for them. Others will make a judgment, say, right, OK, what I want to do is I want to put X amount of fertilizer on this part of the paddock. I want to do something different on another part. And so I think it's uh, case by case, farmers will are individuals and will do individual things. 
you got, let me, let me, uh, we only have a few minutes. I'm just going to keep us moving, ask a couple short questions. Do you think there's any uh, correlation today in today's market between the value of the crop and the use of this technology? Do you see it more in certain kinds of crops and not in others because certain commodity crops for, versus like in California, we've got a lot of grapes and wineries? Do you, short answer, kind of, do you think there's a correlation? Yeah, we've seen uh, you know high value crops, Central Valley, Napa, Sonoma, be very willing to try these technologies, whether they actually adopt them. I think it's still TBD, but we've seen yeah vineyards being very keen to try various sensor packages on roads. Yeah, Linda, you th what do you, you think there, uh, or is it across the board? Is it really a horizontal thing, and anybody can benefit? It's not only if you have crops worth so many dollars per acre? Well, it's mainly the high value crops that are uh, mostly mainly. interested in is experimenting at the moment. You think that'll come down? Do you think, as, as, the, as, as, as Gareth said earlier, as technology improves and comes down that we'll see the level drop? A absolutely, and I also think because you know of, of other crops, there's more required to feed sort of the world. So I, we will definitely prove its value. <laughs> we, we almost see the opposite. I think it really depends on what you sell. So we have a product that starts from a thousand bucks um, versus if you're selling to, so it, if you're selling a much more expensive product then only people with expensive crops can buy it. We see the most value with people that, that have really large farms. There's no way that a, a corn farmer or a soybean farmer that's 2,000 acres can actually look at that whole field. The corn is taller than he is. So this is the first time that he can actually go around it. Whereas if you have a vineyard or an orchard, it's actually a lot easier to walk around and see what's going on. You have a much higher density of people per acre. And so that makes the, the drone, for us, at least worth a little bit less in those high value crops. You know, I think there's a huge impact for most of the farmers from drones, and they don't even know it. Um, you know, most of the largest seed and chemical companies out there use drones to fly their research plots to decide on what type of seed to use in certain climates, what type of fertilizer, and that goes, you know, you never know that you're getting that type of seed because of a drone, but that actually happens. Okay. I, I guess um, high value, low value, it depends on the cost of the remediation. That's really what it boils down to. How easily can I take some remedial action? How cost effective is that? I think that's, that, uh, that's important. I think in terms of scale, what we found is horticulture, I see a lot of applications in New Zealand for things like multi-rotor, fixed, fixed wing. We, we do a lot of um, large scale farming in, the, in our hill country that would be say seven, eight thousand, ten thousand acres, or try and do it in acres. Um, and they, they've either got to have a swarm and they then just use, use that parts of their farm as a barometer. And even then, they need to use a swarm of drones to, to do that. And um, so I think, in our experience, that the fixed wing aircraft is actually cost effective at that sort of level. Right. So it's, again, there's, a, there's a, a number of different platforms that we think we can use. All right, well, I think we got five minutes. So we'll, we'll get as many questions from the audience as we can, please. Thank you. Um, so I have a question and then a follow quick statement that will follow. So um, can any of you or maybe some of the other panels that you know of do direct analysis of chemical composition on, on bare land like the uh, amount of fertilizer, and nitrogen, phosphate, stuff like that composition? Or is it based on the production over time, like the yield for the year? And then secondly, if so, my recommendation is not so much to try to sell this technology to the individual farmers, but to the service providers that cover many farms, like the, the fertilizer you know, sellers and seed sellers and everything else. So the first one is, can you do a direct analysis and then more market suggestion? Um, there is quite a lot of work going on to look at, can we do it directly? And um, there's a lot of work in Australia going on. There's a little, fair bit of work in New Zealand. I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of can we you know, do it on a, a regular farm scale. Um, our approach has been that we look at nutrient concentration within the plant, we look at the, in pasture and in rangeland type situations, we, looked at the, we look at the nutrient concentration within the plant, we look at the plant type, uh, we look at things like dry matter, ME, all of those factors help us build up a, a, an idea of what's the moisture availability within the soil and what's the soil fertility. So that's kind of the way that we've gone about it in pasture land. Obviously in cropping, there's a big incentive to try and look at um, land, bare land to, to, to make those sorts of decisions. And yeah, I think it's an ongoing research goal, but I don't think we're quite there yet. 
All right, let, let's get another question so we can get some of the other panelists. Thank you. Please. That definitely is the golden question. Um, I think it's going to be very soon we're going to see it loosened up as far as on, you know, the actual being able to fly a drone without having a commercial pilot license or a private pri pilot license. I think we're still quite a ways off from beyond, you know, beyond visual line of sight really being an item. I mean, they are working with us, uh, CNN and BNSF, you know, on, on a weekly or monthly basis doing test flights beyond visual line of sight. So technology is there, but I think the regulations, we're, we're still a couple years off, I think, until we get true beyond visual line of sight. I think uh, from a uh, revenue model perspective, we need to reinvent the model of pay-per-click and not to sell them the concept, but to get a quantifiable target that if we achieve that, we will get 15% or 20% of that model. Because farmers need someone to show them that they are there for them, not to take their money while they are challenged by other topics. So I think if you can create such quantifiable method apply it, and if you really trust the model you are proposing to them, then you can make it like pay-per-click, but on farmer perspective. So more, more of a statement than a question. Uh, it's both, because I don't know about the market in New Zealand, if there is anyone introduced that model or not, and then you can replicate it somewhere else. Does anyone want to take that to, well, to the question? Yeah, well, I can say something about it. I, I do agree with you. I think um, what we're starting to see, at least in New Zealand, is that there is uh, a little bit of what the previous gentleman said. Uh, there's a lot of service operators that are starting to use the technology to be offering, you know, the information as a value add. And even, like, um, companies that are selling fertilizer are starting to thinking about the concept of just gathering the data, analyzing, and then offering the analyzed data as a means to be uh, selling their fertilizer in a more applied uh, manner. So it's more, more, you know, sort of being applied in that way where it's tangible and therefore being translated into a yield prior to selling it as a service as such. All right. Well, it's like one last, okay, we got, I, we have one quickie, one quick question. Answer. Who, who's got it? Really? Well, well, we've got them certainly in New Zealand, and I don't want to be hijacking this no, uh, this forum, but we we certainly we've got them. We've got high hill country, and we've got uh, sheep uh, in in very uh, difficult places. So they're being used to be monitoring. They're being used even to be uh, mustering the sheep and the cows, and and certainly uh, and and there's being algorithms uh, developed to uh, to start counting uh, the animals as well, but we're not quite there yet. All right, well, I'd like to thank the panelists. They did a great job. Thank you, and thank you all.